going to start with prayer before we move into the sermon. We're going to read the passage a little further in after we've set the stage for it. So Father God, as we turn to you and to what you have for us in your word, I pray that the words you've given me will speak through your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll be at work in us as a congregation as we walk through these 20 days of prayer together. And this morning, as we focus on one of the passages from that as well. You're here. Speak. We are here to hear you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, how many of us used our prayer guide this week? I see hands. That's good. If we finish the first week of prayer as of yesterday... Two more weeks to go, 20 days of prayer that will lead us into the Discovery Weekend, Friday, October 26th, Saturday, October 27th. It's part of a discernment process that was initiated by Consul, seeking the heart of God for the next chapter at Maranatha. You can read about it uh, in the inside front cover about the process. You can read about the weekend itself on the inside back cover of the prayer guide as well. It's a guided process of three conversations on the Friday night about our past, our present, and our future. And then on Saturday, about things God has put on our heart around three loves, loving God, loving each other, loving our neighbor. And coming out of that, we, we, we're looking for a ministry plan in the new year, probably in the spring, that will emerge from that, give shape to and direction for the next chapter of our life as a church. That's really the purpose of the process and the purpose of the 20 days of prayer is to prepare our hearts for it. I also am hoping that we will grow in the process of that and learning to hear the Spirit and uh, of, of uh, perhaps in regular devotions and things like that too. And we want to encourage everyone who is able, everyone who's part of this congregation, that this is church home, everyone who's able from about high school age and up to take part in this. And not just couples, but as individuals in this. And if you don't have a prayer guide because you missed the last uh, week or two, then you can still pick one up at the info desk. And if you can catch up, that's great. Don't feel you need to. Just pick up where we are because we just want to continue literally being on the same page together uh, as a congregation as we go through this. And then plan to be part of uh, that Discovery Weekend. Now, last Sunday was the beginning of the 20 days of prayer. It was the first day. And... In our service here, we looked at the passage in the devotional for that first day. It was Acts chapter 16. It was a description of Paul and his companions seeking the Holy Spirit for the next leg of their missionary journey. And the Holy Spirit was blocking them from going one way and preaching in another direction. But then the Holy Spirit led them to Macedonia to the city of Philippi. We talked in there then about how they were doing the same thing we are doing, that we are seeking the Holy Spirit and his guidance in our own journey as a church, the next chapter of our life, guided by him, by God, because we belong to him. And we talked about how to hear the Spirit in very practical ways. And if you weren't here and if that's something you struggle with, I'd encourage you, go online, find the sermon, listen to it. There's practical things in there about how to hear the Holy Spirit. Go to our website. Now last week, our prayer focus in the devotional guide was on commitment, first of all. <clears throat> commitment to this process that we are engaging in. And then focused on God's love and God's faithfulness. Good place to start because that's the foundation for everything else that comes. Now yesterday, we began a new section, and it's a section that's entitled The Convicting Work of the Holy Spirit. Yesterday was Psalm 32, where David cries out to God and, uh, and in, in, in repentance about sin for him. This might be a tougher section, because it gets really personal, okay? 
We're letting the Holy Spirit convict us of sin. We're letting God examine us in our lives, in our hearts, and in areas where we might need to repent or where we might need to forgive. And this is a place where we need to be really honest with ourselves and honest with God. And as I said, it may be tougher because of that, but it lays the groundwork for the next sections. It lays the groundwork for the discerning process. As we move into later in this week, into stories about Jesus, shifting our focus to him. And then in the final week, stories about the church and shifting our focus to the church and therefore to Maranatha as well. And finishing with prayer for the Discovery Weekend. But today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at today's devotion in the prayer guide, Psalm 51, and we're going to read the first 17 verses. Let's read that together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you're proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop. And I will be clean. Wash me. I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean, a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. And that passage goes on for two more verses. We're not reading them because in those last two verses, David, the author of this psalm, turns to something corporate about Zion and about the righteous sacrifices taking place in Zion. But those 17 verses are personal. They're very personal. David wrote those after probably the, the greatest failure of his life by far. It was the adultery with Bathsheba. It was the conspiring then in the death of her husband in order to cover up what had happened. And you can hide it, but you can't hide it from God and you can't hide it from yourself. You can get the feeling from this about his own agony in that whole process too. And finally confronted by God through the prophet, Nathan, and then coming clean with God, confessing and seeking him and writing this psalm. So this is the place of his greatest failure. And this is the cry of his heart. And it is instructive for us too. The things that he cried out, the things that he expected, and so forth. And I want to pick up on a couple of things, five of them actually, in the psalm. And the first is this. David honestly faces himself and his sin. We read about that in verses 3 to 5. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He can't get away from it. It's there. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you're proved right when I speak and justified when you judge. And surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, and so forth. 
Now, he doesn't specifically talk about in there what he did, but his sin, and that's the sin with Bathsheba, the sin in the death of her husband, is before him. That's what he's talking about there. It's his anguish over his sin. He can't escape it in verse 3. In verse 4, he's acknowledging that God is right in his judgment. He's saying, I'm going to line myself up with you in this. You're right. I'm wrong. You're right. And he goes even further, actually, in verse 5, when he talks about being sinful at birth. He's, he's saying, it's, it's, it's not like this is the only thing in my life. Fact is, I'm sinful from birth. This is who I am, and this is what I'm about. And this is why I need your mercy and your grace. Now, this kind of honesty is difficult because of shame. Shame gets in the way on these things. It isolates us. It shuts us down. It opens us to condemnation. And honestly, until he came to the Lord, that's what was happening. And you can read in Psalm 32 about some of the condemnation that took place in his life. It may have been that time. It may have been another time. And how it was there until he went to God and dealt with it. Because that's what happens. You have to be honest about it. And the more specific we can be in that, the better it is with God. You know how sometimes we'll pray and, uh, you know, and Lord, forgive my many sins. Amen. And Felix saying, okay, which of the many sins? Because many sins is just to kind of gloss over it. But when we get specific about it, it's a whole different story, isn't it? And that's why in this section we've been letting God convict us of those kinds of things. And if there is conviction there, take it to him then. Don't let that put you under. If there isn't, if there's nothing there that he's saying, then let that be. And don't go picking at scabs and so forth. But honesty is necessary. Shame is tremendous. And the, greatest, the, fa the greater the failure, the greater the shame. And the less we can be honest before God and face it, Shame will cripple us. So, like David, do what he did. Eventually he had to. He got forced into it. We may need to too sometimes. But come to the Lord. Second thing is that David bases his plea for mercy on God's character. It's really quite striking to me. Opens in the, 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 the psalm with, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. He is basing his plea for mercy on God and on God's character, on God's unfailing love, on God's great compassion. He does not cry out for mercy based on who he is. He does not cry out for mercy saying to God, well, you know, that's not really me. I know I messed up, but that's not what I'm really like. He did not cry out for mercy based on comparisons to other, others. Well, I'm not as bad as some other people. He did not cry out for mercy based on, but look at all the good that I've done. And if you weigh that, because that's where we're going when we talk like that. He made his cry for mercy solely on God. On who God is on what he's like, his great love, his compassion. He puts his trust in that. It's really important because there is no other basis for approaching him. But it means we really have to know God that way. We have to know that he is a loving God and a compassionate God and put our trust in that. And sometimes there are things that can get in the way. Wrong ideas that we may have about who God is and what he's like. And they will crop up at times when we're feeling full of shame. He's not vengeful or harsh. He's not just waiting for us to step out of line so that he can go, ha, caught ya. He's not a God who will just give up on us, on you, on me. He's not a God who keeps a list and at some point says, well, I was giving you 15, but now you're at 16. That's it. You're done. No. He is not 
that kind of God. We need to know his great love and compassion. And we need to put our trust in that. And sometimes the way that we learn it is by blowing it and discovering his love and his compassion for us. Because these are places where we can grow in knowing God too. But that's important. We need to know him. Because David bases his plea for mercy on God's character. That's what we need to base it on. It means we need to know his character. Third thing. In this, despite the hugeness of his failure, I mean, think about it. King of Israel, a man with a heart like God's heart, a heart that God loved, who has adultery, produces a child, conspires in the death of her husband, puts him on the front lines and has people, other soldiers pull back. He'll get killed. That'll cover it up. I mean, think about that. David expects his sin to be wiped out. Far from God keeping a list, he expects God to scratch it out, to blot it out, to hide his face from it. That's in verse uh, nine, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And a little earlier in verse seven, he says, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. He's expecting his sin to be just wiped out. In verse seven there, he is referring to ritual cleansing ceremony when he talks about being cleansed with hyssop. He's talking about something God had instituted in the Old Testament as part of the ritual ceremonies that they were to do, not just the sacrifices, but also when cleansing was necessary, there were cleansing rituals, and it involved hyssop and so on. And the word that is translated cleanse me is really an interesting word. Because it literally means something like unsin me. So it's like he's sin, got sin on him, in him. And he's saying, unsin me. That's why he's saying, cleanse me and I'll be whiter than snow. Cleanse me, I'll be clean. It'll be gone. It won't be sticking anymore. And when he goes on, he says, hide your face from my sin, blot out all my iniquity. He's saying, just blot it out like it's not there. Far from a list, it's gone. And hide your face from it would mean, well, you're not always going back and looking at this. You're not always going back and reminding yourself of it. It's not like you got a list and you go back to it. It's gone. You're not turning and looking. David expects his sin to be wiped out. This is an area where we can be our own worst enemy sometimes, having confessed to God, having come to him with it, and we can't let it go. We can't forgive ourselves. Constantly reminding ourselves of our failure. Shame, again, it kicks in. And the sort of thing that isolates and cripples, you know, who am I? Why would God want to use me? And so forth. But that's not God. And that's not the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's Satan. Because that's condemnation, not conviction. That's condemnation and coming under condemnation and putting us into shame and trying to sideline us and cripple us. And that's not what David does here. Despite the nature of his sin, he expects his sin to be wiped out. He expects to be unsinned before God. Fourth thing, David expects God to do something new in him, something that he cannot do himself. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a pure heart, so I can't make it pure. But you can because that's what creation is. Creating makes something out of nothing. Something that didn't exist now does. A pure heart. And so he's turning to God and saying, I can't do it, but you can. So create in me 
that kind of heart. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's a steadfast spirit that means that he would be steadfast, constant in his relationship with God. And he's asking God to do that because he knows his own struggle in that area and it's something he cannot do. He can, he can want it, but he'll slip and he'll slide. And we know that place too, don't we? Come thou fount of every blessing. That song? And these lines, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I lo love. Yeah. He's saying, this is who I am. I can't make this happen, but you can, so create in me a different heart. Uh, renew a spirit in me that wants you, wants your things. And he goes on in verse 12 with some of the similar things. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. That's a spirit in him that is willing, open to God wants God, wants what God wants, and so on. David expects God to do something new in him that he cannot do. And we can expect that too, because these are deep internal things, things we cannot change inside of ourselves, our hearts, our spirits. And we can't change them just by hard work. Yeah, it may take being accountable and so on, discipline. But that alone will not change the heart, will it? And out of the heart will come the fruit. We need something new in us. And that's part of the, work, part, part of the point of the work of conviction. God does not just convict us in order to make us feel bad. God convicts us in order to draw us to him. He convicts us in order to, to make us more like him. It's part of a sanctification process of becoming like him. And it is part then of what the Holy Spirit does to change us on the inside because he's committed to us growing and changing. And so David expects God to create a new heart, a steadfast spirit, a willing spirit, to renew that in him. The fifth thing, God knows, uh, David knows that God wants his heart more than anything else. And those are the verses that we often go back to, and that is, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And you think about that. And you think about when and where he lived. With all of the Old Testament provisions, which are later fulfilled by Jesus, that's why we don't do sacrifices, because the one sacrifice has been made. It's done. But he lived in a time when that's what you did. You took the sacrifices over and over and over and that's what God wanted. And he's saying, actually, you don't delight in that. It isn't the action itself. It isn't the sacrifice. It isn't the religious things that we do. It isn't the going to church. It isn't the serving. It isn't the giving that we do. Whatever that is, it isn't that. It's a heart. And he knew that. A heart that's broken and contrite. And he knew furthermore, God would not despise that. Would never despise a heart like that. And when God finds a heart like that, he takes pleasure in it. And you know what? God hated the sin that David committed. And his holiness demanded that something be done about it. And David, of course, was king. Needed to be confronted on it. He was. I 
I think David's response gave joy to God. Gave him pleasure. Because David was responding with a heart that was pricked then by that and wanted God. And to come to him and be honest and clear this away. He knew that. He experienced that. You may remember from that story, in fact, that there are consequences. The son that they had by that adultery dies. There are other sons. In fact, Solomon is the next one. And he will become king. But there's a consequence. And as the child is dying... David is in sackcloth and ashes before his God. And when the child dies, his courtiers, the people in his court, they don't dare go to him. Because they think, man, if he was that way before the child died, what will he be like when he finds out? He notices them talking, says, what's going on? So they tell him. And he gets up. And he cleans himself because he's been in sackcloth and ashes and puts on good clothes and goes to eat where he had been fasting. And they're astonished. Why? And he said, well, as long as the child is alive, God might have been moved to change his mind. But now that it is done, he lives. That's the exact opposite of shame. It's the exact opposite of shame that kills you, isolates you, cripples you, tears you down. This is something that knowing God, knowing that you've dealt with your stuff before him and that he has dealt with you, that he has blotted all this out, unsinned you, that he's at work putting a new spirit in you, a new heart in you, changing you on the inside, and you may not see it yet, but it's there. He's at work. Well, you can go on and live. And the greatest failures can then become an open door for something. God takes pleasure in a certain kind of heart that David describes here, a heart that's broken and contrite, a heart that's honest and humble before him, that is turned towards him. And when he finds that, he takes pleasure in that. He loves hearts like that. And he'll never despise a heart like that. And never turn away a heart like that. And that's a tremendous source of comfort and courage for us. And I believe that God wants to break, among other things in this congregation, that he wants to break the power of shame in us, individually and as a congregation. I think he wants us to know him for his unfailing love and his great compassion, to know him for who he truly is, and to be able then to live before him as David did here, even in his greatest failure. His mercy, his grace, who he is. That is what gives us joy in our salvation, the joy that, that David re, uh, references in this psalm where he says, you know, let me hear joy and gladness, let the bones you've crushed rejoice. And a little later, uh, about uh, restore to me the joy of your salvation. This is where the joy comes from. It is knowing God in this way and knowing his grace, his mercy for us. And then we will share it, which is what David did. In verse 15, 14, he says, save me from blood guilt. Yeah, it was blood guilt. Oh, God, the God who saves me. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Because that's what happens in these kinds of places when we know that we are forgiven, that the sin is blotted out, that it's gone, that we are unsinned, that he takes joy in our hearts. We have something to share with other people. And that's so typical of David. So many times in his Psalms, as he's talking to God about the struggles that he's having, you know, save me and I will tell others. And it's not like, you know, save me and then I'll tell. You know, that's like I'll make you a trade. No, it'll be because of the joy that's been restored, the gladness that's there. 
And we can't share what we don't know, and God wants us to know him bone deep, his mercy, his grace, his love, his compassion. And Psalm 51 shows us the way to that. Our greatest failures, honestly faced, can open the door to truly knowing grace, to knowing God deeper, to loving him more deeply. That's Psalm 51. I want to encourage us to keep pressing into prayer for the rest of the 20 days. That's today's devotional. But it was the coming week. In the week, we're going to be turning to stories of Jesus who he is, what he's done, some of those things. There's many more stories, but a few of them. And then the final week, stories of the church and God's relationship to the church and starting to reflect on Maranatha there, what it means to belong to him as a body. And end with a devotion on the Friday that will lead us in prayer for that weekend and for the things that God wants to do among us at that discovery weekend. This morning, though, this is where we are. And this is where I want to end. This is where I want to pray for us, then, as a congregation, that we would know God more deeply here in who he is. We're going to move after that into the benediction and then into the doxology. And our focus will be on sweet mercies fall from heaven. Sweet mercies for us. So why don't you stand with me? Let's pray together. Father God, David in the place of his greatest failure and facing it, wrote this psalm that we read and that we talked about this morning. And I pray that some of the things you laid on my heart based on this psalm will penetrate us, will sink deep into our own hearts and into our own spirits, because there are things I think you want us to know. You want us to know you, and I pray that we will, that as individuals and as a congregation, we will come to know you more and more deeply. And that we do not have to hide from each other or from you, but can face it, deal with it, find joy of our salvation restored. Know you more deeply in your unfailing love and your compassion. May we cry out to you always on that basis, on who you are. And may we know you in that way. May we grow together as a congregation then in, in, in seeing the power of shame broken and lives released in ways that we don't even know about. Because those are the secret private places of our hearts often where the Satan gets a foothold and condemns us. I speak against Satan in those places. In the name of Jesus, command him to leave this congregation and leave individuals in it alone. And that instead we may hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking and to learn the difference and to turn to you. And that in breaking the power of shame, you will release life here. The life that David talks about with the joy and gladness of his salvation. And may, it be, may we be a place, may we be a place where sins are blotted out, not just because it's forgotten and, you know, but because they're forgiven. And because they're forgiven, gone. Blot them out. And may we be a kind of place then that a community turns to and where we can share that. Because there are many who need to know that. And they need you, Jesus. And they need a community then that lives you. As imperfectly as we do it, may we live you. That's my prayer for us. As we go from here, having talked about facing God honestly with things, about 
repentance, about forgiveness, about the things that God does there, the things we can expect from him to do something new in us, the sins to be wiped out, and so on. Receive his blessing because he blesses us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may that be true even in the places where you struggle and where you fear the darkness. May he lift his countenance towards you. May he grant you peace now and always because his sweet mercies flow from heaven. Amen.